<laughs> it's got you. You're doing a, if, like a, if it's KSCT, it's real early in my career. Very, I was a young kid. Yeah, well, I understand that, and I can hear it. You got a, you got a little, you got a little bit of that in you. You know, hey, you beginning. got a little yuck in you. Hey, everybody. <laughs> Six o'clock, and this is Spike at the mic, where eleven $1, hundred seventy dollars could be yours in the Missing Links Part Two. It's wonderful because Spike, you. I'm, I'm thinking back to that time. It was 1980, and I remember yeah. very well. Uh, it's like you were doing what, what was becoming really popular on the FM stations at the time. You were doing a morning zoo, but you were by yourself doing a morning zoo. You oh like yeah, yeah. 15 people and and sound effects and production up to yin yang. And yeah. to me, that's that's what that's what the great radio was all about. Wait a sec. We're gonna. We're going to make sure that you can give the world heck this morning. Everybody, okay, I, I, I don't want you laying there drooling on the pillow now. Are you ready? Huh? Not a bad. Time for calisthenics. Touchdown. Uh, hey, all. Every morning. Hip, 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 hip. It's not just. Hip, 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 hip. Now and then. Now and now be doing that push-up. Give that chicken fat back to the chicken. And you'll be chicken again. along a couple of toot toots to some gals who were parked out there at the stoplight. There you go. Have a good morning, gals. As you go to work there in the rest of the Quad Cities as you travel off to work or school or whatever. 21 before 7. You said uh, you like who? Elvis. You like Elvis? I love Elvis. But uh, you didn't think I'd play it for you? Well, I didn't think nobody else liked him. <laughs> you don't think anybody else likes Elvis? Not around here. Hang on a second. Hello, dear. Hello. Do you like Elvis Presley? No. No. Oh, wait a second. Do you like Elvis? Hello. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. You like Elvis? Hang on a second. Guy thinks I don't like Elvis. What are you yelling about? Hang on a second. What? Come here. We're going to play. Are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Sing with me. Oh, now sing. Then I came across one. It's a, it's a, actually a WGN air check that was put out by WGN or published by WGN anyway. And um, it's uh, you with various bits. And it's just, it's just fabulous. Um, trying to think. Oh, yeah. You, you were talking to that lady who was giving you the, uh, uh, a uh, recipe for fruitcake. And it included a gallon of whiskey. Do you recall that at all by any chance? Oh, yeah, I do, kind of, yeah, yeah. (laughs) That was just one of the bits that's in there. So there were several of them, and I think it's about four minutes long, but I'm going to put it in the podcast for for listeners. Oh, okay. I never listen to that stuff. I just, I just, I'm one of these guys that, that, you know, you did it once, and I don't want to hear it again. (laughs) Well, I'm the same way. I'm weird that way. I'm yeah. the same way. I, I packed around a lot of tapes for a lot of years, and I said, you know, I'm not going to listen to this stuff. Out it goes. Yeah. And that was uh, 30 years ago, and it hasn't bothered me at all. I so, hear you. I, I'm just uh, I'm pleased to be able to talk to you, and because it's you, I didn't feel like I had to do a lot of uh, a lot of preparation. I didn't do a lot of research. Yeah. That's yeah. the best part. You just we'll just let it rip. You're just a guy who just talks, so that's cool. <laughs> Talk too much, yeah. Okay, Spike Odell. I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna admit to you right up front. I never heard you on the radio when you were still on the radio live. And really, yes, <laughs> but you're the some, one. Uh, yeah, I'm the one. I've got some wonderful <laughs> examples here, and I'm going to be sharing with uh, with with our listeners. But uh, what I do know is that. Uh, your reputation at WGN caught my attention and 
WGN itself, and I'll just start there with that for you. It's the most amazing radio station I've been aware of in my entire career, in that uh, it's it's the greatest small town station in the world, in one of the major metropolitan, you know, the second largest city in the country. I I, I can't imagine that working anywhere except in Chicago, and uh, at the time it was. Uh, it was so special. Maybe you could just kind of ex- expound on that and, and explain it a little bit, the WGN phenomenon. Well, you, you kind of described it yourself there. It's, it's unlike any other station I've ever heard or, uh, or I ever worked for. It, uh, it was a great big, small station. Uh, they, uh, they, 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 they pretty much let you go. They let you develop yourself. You, you became uh, uh, you became what you made of yourself. It was uh, it was one of those stations to where everybody was open to you. When you first start, you wonder if you'll be accepted. Yeah. I always wondered. Well, yeah, I'm a, I'm a guy from a small town. I you know this I never worked in a in an area full of so much concrete in my life. It's downtown Chicago, what's going on? And you wonder if people will accept that. And 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 they they. They open their arms. They listen. They reserve. Uh, they reserve the right to accept you or not. And then after a while, they they open up and they let you into their life. And by the time I left, I, I didn't realize it when I left. But that's what I missed the most was was connected with the people. With, with I, I had I had no idea I would be that. Am I making sense? I mean, it's it's just. Yeah, it was such a connection that I just I didn't realize I would miss it that much, but I but I sure did. That's the part of radio I really miss is is the connection with the people, people you work with, and the people you work for, meaning your audience. Yeah. right? and WGN was one of those stations that it was it didn't come from a consultant's template. It it, it was we were what everybody was talking about that particular day. If it was. If it was the Cubs, okay. It was the Cubs. If it was Michael Jordan, okay. If it was politics, all right. Uh, if planes were flying into buildings, we shut down everything and did that. Uh, it, it just—it was just one of those, just special stations that that just magically worked. And everybody on the air, we worked hard. We played hard. We were not all politically the same or socially the same or. Or, or or what? But but even though we disagreed, sometimes we all uh, agreed to disagree, and and we were friends, and we loved each other, uh, yeah. d- despite how different we were. Uh, that that was the cool part about WGN. Quick little digression here, based on something you said a moment ago. Then I, I want to get, come back to what you're just talking about. But uh, you said this was not created by consultants. One of the first things I, I was thinking about as I uh, as I heard the uh, uh, I heard you earlier in your career at KSTT in what Davenport, right? Davenport, Iowa. Yeah, uh, and 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 then and you were working top forty radio, and you were doing top forty radio the way everybody did top forty radio in nineteen eighty. And yep. uh, I, and then I was so I was wondering, it's like okay, so then I, I've forgotten where you went from there, but I'm wondering if by the time you got to WGN. Did somebody sit you down and go, okay, you know that stuff you do, that's the stuff that we heard on the air check and stuff? Would say, we need you to stop doing all that. We just need you to be who you are. Just be you. Did anybody ever, did you have to do that? No. No one ever had that conversation with me. They, uh, they, when I went to uh, WGN, I, I, was, I was coming from a station, uh, Kick, uh, Kick 104 in Davenport. And I, I was half the time I was talking, uh, jet, you know, jabber John. The other half, I'd I'd, I'd play the music. Uh, and, and WGN at the time they hired me was looking for, uh, as every station always is doing, is a, a younger audience. Uh, I, I actually, I was actually hired to uh, replace Wally Phillips, the legendary oh Wally Phillips. Uh-huh. And that scared me because you know nobody replaces Wally Phillips. Wally yeah. was the franchise, I hear uh, you. Yeah. but they they wanted younger blood to come in in his stead, uh, 
and and they 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 liked what they heard, and, and I didn't really get a lot of fine tuning until I went to the morning show. I started on the afternoon show, where it was uh, it was a it was much more up tempo, a lot more fun. When I went to mornings, yeah, we we did get into you know the news of the day a lot more than than I did on the afternoon show. But uh, I never had that conversation you're asking about. No, no one ever did that with me. That's good. <laughs> yeah, it was great. It made me feel comfortable. Yeah, the smartest, the smartest programmers in the world, just uh, and 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 general managers, uh, they hire the best people they can find, uh, do everything they can to make you happy, and then stay out of your hair. You know, let Absolutely you do your right. thing. Yeah. Absolutely right, John Garrett over at WLS. I never, never got to work for John. I like him a lot. He's, uh, yeah, I, I admire him and I look up to him. But he made a statement one time. He says. Uh, he says, by the time they get to this level, they should know what they're doing. He says, I pay my guys a lot of money and get out of their way. Yeah, <laughs> that sounds like, I like John. That. I got, I got to meet him a little bit when I was a couple of times when I was there. Yeah, yeah when I was, you know, I just wanted to reflect on what you said about uh, Chicago, and that is because I spent three, almost three full months working in radio in Chicago. Well, and, you do uh, more than a lot of guys do. <laughs> This this was in 2012. I just make the story real brief, but it, it was I was I was hired to uh, to be one of the new personalities on uh, the Merlin Media Station. I can't tell you the call letters or, the, or even the dial position because it kept changing while we were putting the station. <laughs> that was the Randy Michaels. It was a fabulous. Oh sure, fa- yeah, it was yeah, a fabulous uh, uh, undertaking from the beginning. We had so much fun putting that radio station together, and uh, we got on the air. And I'd been working there for for 89 days, and told and every day I the program director and everybody else go, oh, God, gosh, you sound great on the air, and well, we're doing so good, and we're going to great. And then on the 89th day, he says, I need you to come meet somebody, and it was the HR director. Wow. She said, she said, uh, uh, well, we're we're letting you go today. I said, why? I've been getting great reports from everybody, and then and then my program director said, Andy Friedman. We're still friends. He said, well, we're not going to go into that. I said, you're not going to tell me why? He says, no, no, we just need to tell you a few things, have you signed some paper. And I said, excuse me, Andy. I said, I, I have to, when I get out of this room, I have to go to a phone and call my wife in Los Angeles and tell her she's in the process of packing a moving van of all of our earthly possessions. They're getting ready wow. to hit the road in a couple of days and come to Chicago. The house is gone. Everything's gone. I got to call and tell her I've been fired. She's going to want to know why. And I'm going to tell her, I don't know. (laughs) They won't tell me. But in the back of your mind, you're thinking, yeah, you're thinking, is there more to this? There there is more to this, but but I hope it's not what they think it is. Right. Yeah, it's, it's like, well, you know, my wife trusts me, but now she's got to start thinking, what did he have his hands in somebody's pants or what? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. and the, now the upshot is here's, here's the thrill thing. It was the 89th day. I've said that because on the 90th day, I would have been vested with the union after him oh, and they would have owed me some money and they would have owed me some yeah. time and one thing and another. So they did this in the 89th day. And that was, 11 years ago, and to this day, nobody has ever told me why wow. they got rid of me. It's funny how corporations do that, huh? Well, that's just, that's and that and that goes to what I was saying. Is, uh, the difference between radio used to be and the way it is now, and certainly the way radio was in WGN at the time, uh, I haven't listened in a long time. I don't know if there have been any big changes there. But what you all did and what you did in Davenport – that was that was the radio that used to enthrall people, entertain them, inform them, make you make people feel like you really were the guy that just lives down the street. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's what everybody told me of what they liked about me. I just you know, I was just being me, but I'll, I'll go back to your uh, your your departure from Chicago. I was one of those guys uh, in radio. That uh, well, I guess I'm an oddity because I, I worked in radio for 33 years and I never ever got fired. I never got fired. You know, being fired is like a badge of honor, but I, I never got fired. I was I was lucky enough that it never happened to me. Uh, 
I, I was just, I was, I never, I never sent out an audition tape. I never sent out, uh, <laughs> you know, an application to, to, to work at a certain station. I, I just always got a phone call and they said, come over here. We want to talk to you. And that's how it yeah. all worked. So I was lucky in that regard. You weren't lucky. You were special. That's what that is. <laughs> that's just, well, that's, uh, no, seriously. I, I appreciate I mean, that. It it was, uh, you know, some people, you know, you'll sit around and have a few beers with the guys and they'll tell you how many times they were fired. And I I only worked for five stations uh, and, and one of them was just part time. So, uh, you know, it was pretty cool in that regard. Uh, I, I guess I was just lucky. It's an, it's an interesting business in that respect. And I, I will explain this for listeners who never worked in radio or certainly not on the air is you're right. It's not, I, I don't know if I'd go so far as to call it a badge of honor, but getting fired is certainly no shame uh, unless what you've done is shameful, but uh, yeah, not in the radio. You know, yeah. I, it's, it's just, it's part of the business. It's part of, it's about uh, ratings. It's about whether or not you fit the radio station, whether you're, working well together with other people, whether the chemistry works and all that stuff. There's so many different things. Here's the way I look at it. And I have, I have no problem even with, with the idea of ageism. And I was told that that's prob- probably why I was booted out of Chicago because I was older than most of the other people. And I probably tended to sound that way to Randy Mar- Michaels, but here's the thing. Ageism is not a problem for me in radio because it's, it's to me, it's exactly like if you're hiring actors for a movie or a TV show, if you need somebody who's 60 years old, you don't get a 35 year old, you know, it, it, yeah. it's just, it's just not going to work. So to me, it's, it's not a, it's not a problem. And the whole thing about being fired, I would say, yeah, you're really unique. I don't know that I've known anybody who's ever been in the business for any length of time without, without moving on. They say they, uh, you know, you can tell a disc jockey because there's no rust on his bumper hitch. <laughs> You know, I'm not saying I should have been fired a couple of times. I probably should have, but uh, it, it just it, it never came to be. So, yeah, uh, you know, knock on wood. Of course, what do I care? I'm retired. Right. That's right. You are. And that was another yeah. thing that I, th- I thought about before we've had this conversation. We had a little conversation a week or two ago. And um, I thought, just what a terrific guy. Just a, just a, you know, you're one of those people and you meet a few of these people through your life where, you meet them one time and then you feel like you've known them for a very long time. And I wondered if number one, if that's the reason you never got fired and number two, you know, 33 years is a long time, but it's not a lifetime. And there are a lot of people in this business who have been in it for a lifetime. I've been in for 53 years on the air yeah. and it's not because wow. it's not because I'm that much in love with the business. The business has changed so much that I, I really can't say I'm in love with it. Certainly not the way I was many years ago, but uh, I'm wondering if it maybe wasn't a little easier for you to retire because you did your thing. You did it. Well, you were well-received, you made a few bucks and now it's time to go live your life. It might've been a little easier for you. Well, uh, you're, you're right. You're right in that regard. I, you know, my wife, who I've been married to for just about 50 years now. Uh, this year will be 50 years. So, uh, we always said from way back when uh, that that we were going to retire when we were 55 and go travel the world. Uh, that was our goal, and we stuck to it. It got kind of goofy there with the economy and stuff, but we, we and I, I say we, I, I, I should say she was the one that, uh, she was the business mind in our marriage or you know, she would always uh, make sure there was plenty of savings. We we, we invested this. We did this right. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, and you know, the longer you work, the more you make. Uh, usually, and there towards the end, I was making a pretty good penny. And we just we we sucked half of it away for years, half of it. Wow. And and you know, we could have lived in the bigger house. We could have driven the fancy cars. We could have bought the airplanes to fly around. Uh, but, but if I did that, I'd have to work till I was 75 years old and I'm not going to do <laughs> that. Right. Right. So I just pulled the plug at age 55 and we did travel the world for a few years. And then as, uh, you know, as they say, life happens, my mother, uh, came down with the Alzheimer's and, uh, we, we had to take care of her. 
and I don't, I don't, that's not a problem for me. She wiped my butt for, for all those years. And if I have to, I will for her, you know, uh, that's, yeah. that's your mama. You take care of your mama. You, you, you do that. So that, uh, that stopped us traveling for a while, but, uh, uh, oh, we're happy. She, uh, she, uh, she, uh, sadly passed away three years ago and now we stay busy just chasing grandkids around Tennessee. I was going to say, uh, at that time when you did retire at 55, you, uh, your, your family was growing into their own. So that must've been a very important and special time that, uh, was, was certainly give you great reason to be uh, happy to not have to get up in the middle of the night and go do four hours on the radio. You know, I I told everybody there <clears throat> at the, at the station that I'm, I'm going to be leaving when I'm 55, and and they didn't believe me. Uh, right. Uh, they just kept coming and saying, "Are you are you going to re up?" Uh, and because they wanted me for another three years, and I said, "No, uh, I'm leaving on this you know in this year." And then even six months before, they said, "You're not going to re up." I said, "No, I, I'm going. I told you I'm going." Uh, and so I, I think I still kind of surprised him when I, when I stuck to my, uh, to my guns and I did what I said I was going to do. Nobody believed I was going to do it. So I found it kind of a surprise that they were shocked when I did pull the plug, but, uh, <laughs> no regrets, no regrets. I, uh, I, I made absolutely the right decision. Radio was getting kind of goofy anyway. So I just, uh, yeah, that was a good time to say adios. You left what? 1987. Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, 93 I, something. Pardon me. Uh, it was 2000. Uh, I can't even think two, uh, December of 2008. I left was okay. my last year. Yeah. I'm sorry about that. I think 87 is when you actually started at WGN. That was, uh, yeah, that's when I started at GN. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. So the early two thousands, yeah. Radio was getting weird is right. Uh, you, you kind of touched upon that when we had a little private conversation, I didn't, didn't ask you for your thoughts or feelings. I'll ask you now, and you can say as little or as much as you want. You can uh, be uh, extremely uh, tactful about it, just kind of sidestep it if you want. But I'll tell you what, from my perspective, and I'm still gainfully employed doing morning radio here in Dallas, um, and I'm grateful for it, but it's not the same thing. I mean, you know, no. the, 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 corp, the corporate in the, the the fact of the matter is that what used to be a radio station that was owned generally by local ownership, people who lived in the community along with the rest of you, um, that's turned into a corporate uh, undertaking where that's a, that uh, is beholden to stockholders. And we've got radio stations that are radio co corporations that own two, 300 stations. They don't know yeah. what you're doing in, in um, you know, Davenport or in Chicago or wherever you happen to be. And I've gotten the yeah. impression they don't pretty much care. They're, they just need to keep the bottom line moving up. Now we've gotten to a point spike where we're, we're um, very much, very often we feel like we're not radio personalities anymore. We are there to get people to click on their computers and go from website to website and go visit our, you know, um, yeah. It's just not the same thing anymore. Well, <clears throat> uh, you've you've worked there beyond or in this environment beyond me with computers and, and social media and all that stuff. I didn't I didn't really deal with it. It was just starting when I left. Uh, but it was getting goofy. It was getting very corporate. It was getting very. I mean, we had consultants that would come in and say, "You can't say this word or that word." I got hauled in a couple times for referring to something that happened before 1975. <laughs> uh, 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 you know, you don't attract younger people if you talk about things before, you know, all that stuff. Uh -huh. we, we were told we could not use the word degrees, you know, uh, 47 degrees at O'Hare Airport now. You you don't say that. You just say 47 at O'Hare. And I said, what was the what? problem with degrees? Because some big fat consultant in New York smoking a cigar said that, and it felt like he had to earn his money to do it, and it was just <laughs> it getting was, silly. You did. Well, it's just I have really I, getting I, silly. I got one for you. This this happened just a couple of weeks ago. I had a couple of months ago. Um, right, <laughs> program director, very nice guy, very nice guy. Um, uh, yeah, he, he calls me and he says, he says, I heard you this morning. He said, uh, uh, you're you're telling the time. 
and you said it was seven minutes after seven. I said, yeah. He says, don't say that. Say it's 7.07. So why? Yep. He said, that was another he said one. well, yep. the people, don't, people don't have analog clocks anymore. We have digital clocks. Yeah, so I heard that people word. today don't think of, you know, the way you used to say things. I go, okay. But, but my point is it was just silly stuff like that. Just, that's just one small example of, of stuff that was starting to happen. And, and you're right. They, they started pulling back your creativity and, and what got you to the dance. They didn't want you to do anymore. Yeah. And it was just that, why, you know, why do you want me? <laughs> you know, right. Uh, you you know you can train a monkey to say that you know, uh, it, it just it got so frustrating for a while. But I, and don't take me wrong, don't get me wrong. I loved radio. I loved my job. I love getting up in the morning. I love going to work. But but more and more of that stuff was piling on, and I thought, well, okay, it's it's a good time to just go off and do what I said I was going to do. So I did. Yeah. Well, I hear you. It's, uh, it's, it's a little bit of heartbreaking. I'll tell you what, what, what's hardest on me. And it's, it's not even the whole corporate thing. It's the fact that when I started in radio and I was, you know, 17 and, uh, we'd go to my job in a very small market, Yuba city, California. And, uh, we would, uh, the, the jocks, we would all get together <clears throat> before, during, after, between air shifts. We would hang out at night. We would sit in somebody's apartment and listen, listen to air checks of uh, the big time disc jockeys. And we would just talk about radio. We breathed it. We would, you yeah. know, we were, we would have li these little, uh, like, uh, uh, little, uh, seminars among ourselves. You know, we could gather in the production room <laughs> or something and, and talk about the craft and how you do this and why you do that and don't do this. And here's the reason. And we, we learned it just by doing it together. And you can't find those conversations anymore. No, uh -uh. It, it's you all different. You're, you were like me. I, uh, I, I, I became really fond of radio while listening to, you know, uh, Land Decker, uh, Fred Winston, uh, Lou Jack, uh, Dick Biondi. Uh, just, you know, I, I, I lived 185 miles west of Chicago. So I, I would listen to Chicago at night a lot. And, and, and those guys just, they just captured my imagination. And I thought, you know what, those guys have more fun than I am. I got to try this. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, I guess that's the lament of all old men in one respect or another, you know, the good old days and all that stuff. Yeah, but I I still think it could work. I think it could work with the new technologies if uh, you know if somebody somebody put it together. I know that uh, Tom Langmire I think is kind of working on that aspect of the business from uh, small markets, small markets plural. He's working there in uh, what uh, upstate New York, not New York. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. It's up by the Great Lakes. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. Tom is uh, one of those guys who just he just. He's a radio guy. He eats, yeah. breathes, thinks radio. That's that's his entire life. He's a good guy. Talk to me a little bit about your family. I'd like to br have you brag on him. Well, I married a saint. Uh, I met her the first day of uh, college at a little junior college in Nebraska in the produce section of a Safeway grocery store. <laughs> uh, little did I know, her father was the vice president of the college. Uh, she fell in love with my uh, cousin, dated him for six or seven months, and then uh, that broke up, and and I was there for a shoulder to lean on for her, and one thing grew into another. You were a I rebound? Married her about three, huh? Yeah, <laughs> I married her about three years later, and uh, we've got uh, two children. Uh, we lived in uh, East Moline, Illinois, up there in the Quad Cities before I went to Chicago, and now we're down here in in Nashville, uh, where my kids, uh, they, they moved out here and said, dad, we're not going back to that cold weather in Chicago. We're staying here. So if we wanted to see them, we had to come here. So we did. And we, i tell you what, I never in my life thought I would live in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, but I, you know what, what, a, what a great spot to live. This town is awesome. I, I, I just can't imagine 
uh, that I didn't know about it earlier. It's just really a great place to live and raise a family or, or grandkids anyway. I, I've been to Nashville and I feel the same way about it, but I would never had the opportunity to live there. So how many grandkids have you got? Got five. Got five. five. Wow. I think that's it. So, uh, <laughs> but, uh, the five came in rapid succession and, uh, we follow them from one soccer game to a baseball game, to jujitsu, to soccer class, to dance class. So it's just, it never ends. Can't ask for any more than that. That's the best, buddy. It's the best. I just, you know, it's it's like they say, why didn't we have grandkids first? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> exactly. The kids were a pain in the ass, but the grandkids are delightful. <laughs> Listen, let me ask you about, about your painting. You're a wonderful painter. You're, you do watercolors exclusively? Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, by the way. I appreciate that. Oh, no, I'm, I, uh, I'm, I'm not just blowing smoke. Anybody can go online and uh, just uh, Google Spike Odell uh, artwork or paintings, and uh, you'll see what I'm talking about. How'd you get into that, and what uh, you know, what carried you along? You know what started it was the pandemic. I uh, I always, you know, I had a little watercolor set that I, I had a buddy that did watercolors, and he was just awesome, just incredible. I, he's still my favorite artist. And I just thought, how do you do that, man? So uh, he told me what to get, and I bought it, and I always had it in the closet. I had the same set of watercolors and same pad of paper for 30 years. And, you know, once every two years, I'd pull it out and try it. And, and, you know, I I, I guess that was just dabbling, if you want to call it that. But then when when the COVID stuff came along, you know, you're in the house. Where are you going to go? You can't go anywhere. I had to figure out something to do. So I got that stuff out. And thankfully, Amazon still delivered, so I, I got what I needed that way. And I just started painting. I paint every day. I've painted two pictures already this morning. <laughs> that's that, that's how much I, I, I love to do it, and I practice all the time. And with each painting, the next one's a little better than the last one. You know? yeah. So you, you learn from, from your mistakes, and you'll make a lot of mistakes when you first start. But And I still do, too, but it's... Uh, <laughs> Uh, it, again, it's a learning process, and I, I just I find a joy, a peace, uh, just a just just a love that I I, I never knew I would I, w- I would like it that much. It, it's it's so much so much fun to do, and it. it's so cool to see the finished product when you're done. Did you take any kind of lessons or get any no. you know, professional help or never no? never took a lesson? I didn't know I could even draw a straight line. I just. Good I happens. just tried it, and each one, like I say, each one got a little bit better uh, than the last one because you learn from your mistakes. So it's just it's been very cool. I, I thank God every day I, I learned how to do this because I love it. You are a charmed man. You've had <laughs> well, you've had this wonderful success and everything you've done. Everything I don't know what all you've done, but I mean, you you might have. You might have been the the, the world's uh, worst uh, uh, car mechanic in the world, for all I know. But uh, you know, just to be able to just jump in and do it—that's just that's a wonderful thing. Am I missing something? But it seemed to me that I read in your in uh, a little bit a little blurb about you that you did something else in in an artistic vein. I don't know. Was it was it acting? Or was it little theater or something of those that nature? No, never did that. I have stage fright. I'm one of these guys who comes from the world of radio that does yeah. not like to be on stage. Yeah. Now I'll talk in a studio to a tin can with two or three of my friends around me. That doesn't bother me, but I don't want to be on stage. I don't want to take the microphone up there. I don't want a spotlight on me. I want to get out of the way. That's what I love about Nashville. You know, Chicago, you, you know, after a while, people kind of figure out who you are. They, they see your face around. They, they, they recognize you more often. Not that it's, you know, not mm-hmm. that I'm, Brad Pitt and everybody follows you around with paparazzi and not, not like that, but, but it, it got a little weird, you know, after a while down here, nobody knows who you are. They could care less who you are. And that's why I like it. I think that's why the country stars like it here. Everybody sees them there. They leave them alone and they do their own thing. <laughs> it's a, it, it's just uh that, that's one of the reasons I'm here, I guess. Well, I don't know what more to say, but thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for um, the inspiration. I'm serious about that. You've, you've already, 
as long as I've been in this business and I've done well, you know, I've, I've had some success, um, in uh, major markets as well as medium markets that I spent a time, but I never stopped learning. And I start, I, I, I'm still learning from people that I consider to uh, have su- superior skills to mine. And you're one of them as, as well, long I as appreciate I appreciate that. Well, as, as long as I have gone through the process that I think most of us go through, and that is learning our craft, learning the, the ropes, learning, the rules, and then eventually you get to a point where you can learn to bend the rules and then to break the rules and then to forget the rules. And yeah. all along the line, you're looking for your own identity in this yeah. business. And there is one day that occurs to you, and I remember that day. I remember I was sitting, I was working on uh, KROY in Sacramento, doing top 40. And for the first time in my career, I was still young in my career, but for the first time, I had this great feeling of peace that settled over me as I was I just closed the microphone and the record spinning. And I got, this is who I am right here. This is it. I figured it out, but it, it continues to change, man. It's, it's, uh, yeah, it's the thing. It sure that I does. Well, I'll tell you what, uh, uh you're at, uh, KLIF. Yeah. Uh, back in the day, uh, Jim Davis was a program director there. If I'm not mistaken. Right. I think you're right. Yeah. 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 Uh, when I was working part time in Moline, Illinois, our program director evidently knew Jim, and he sent a bunch of audio up of uh, the air staff and wanted Jim's, uh, you know, his thoughts on on how we sounded. And I'll never forget what Jim Davis said about me. We all got it in a staff meeting, and he was reading all these uh, observations. And he said uh, about me, he said. Uh, he said, this guy, this kid is a diamond in the rough. Don't let this one get away. Wow. <laughs> and I thought, I thought, you know what? That's a big time program director from Dallas. Yeah. Yeah. Telling this little kid who's working at a factory, who's making tractors in Rock Island, Illinois, uh, who's, who's thinking about going to radio full time, but can't afford it because the tractor factory paid more money. And I, that was enough to, to kick me in the butt and say, go for it. You're young enough. Try it. If you, if you fail, uh, you can always go back to the factory, but if you don't try, you'll wonder about it for the rest of your life. So in a way, KLIF has, has, has a part in that story for me personally, because, uh, I, I took what he said and I thought, you know what, if he thinks that, okay, I'm going to try it. I'm going to have to believe you. I'm glad I did. Yeah. (laughs) Sure, glad well, I did. I think we've all uh, we've all managed to to uh, climb up uh, thanks to the inspiration of uh, of people like that. I certainly have mine, Spike. I'm going to probably talk to you again from time to time, just because I want to talk to you again. We want to don't have to sit down and record it, but you got it. <laughs> at some point. We may ask you to do that again too, because it's just uh, been delightful, and I appreciate it. Well, it's been fun. I th- I appreciate you thinking of me. I really do. Uh, I I've, I've had a lot of fun, and and good luck to you down there. Well, thank you very much. You know, the one other thing I was going to say about Chicago, and I kind of got uh, sidetracked there when I was telling my sob story, but you said something about the uh, people in Chicago, and the thing that struck me, and this is why I don't I, I don't know that WGN could have ever worked in any other major major city in the country. But uh, one thing that I realized after I got there, and I'd been working in Los Angeles for 12 years, you know, and I worked a little bit in San Francisco. I'm not completely unknown in, in, in really big towns, but I got to Chicago and I said, not only is this place absolutely gorgeous with the architecture and everything else, but the people are just so unbelievably nice and down home and laid back and all that stuff. Had people, total strangers on the street that would see me consulting my uh, the map on my on my smartphone, and uh, walk up and say, "Can I help you find something?" That doesn't yeah. happen in Los Angeles, you know. Yeah, yeah. So, you yeah, know, my producer. It, it occurred to me that my, you're, they're they're Midwesterners. Yeah, that's what my producer said. She lived right downtown Manhattan. She wanted to get out of New York City, so she came to Chicago. I hired her. And she said, uh, one of the first things she said was, she said, I like this town. People 
people actually open the door and hold it for you. She said, yeah. you know, the door would be slammed to my face in New York. So uh, I think the I think what you say is uh, is evident to a lot of people when they when they come to Chicago. Spike Odell, go do what you do in in retirement. Right, buddy. Uh, I want to go paint day. a picture. How's that? All right. Thank you so much. I'll talk again. Okay. All right, I'm going to leave. Thank you so much. I'm going to, I'm going to leave uh, the audience with uh, a piece of uh, Spike Odell gold from WGN. It's just kind of a combination of bits and pieces. And uh, I think you listen to this, you'll be able to understand why people in Chicago still love this man. Radio 720. The number one thing will be for the players to believe that they can win. They have to believe that they can win. And if they believe that, then we've got a chance to win. You gotta believe a man named Spike. Players have to believe that they can win. Yeah, to be able to win. So if they believe that, they can win. Basically what he's saying is they have to believe that they can win. win. And if they they believe believe that, then we've got a chance to win. Spike Odell. Pull that card out, will you? Just pick it up for me. (laughs) A man you can believe in. (laughs) Hey, Otis. Hi, how you doing? Otis von Ortner, long time no talk, big fella. How's everything up in Alaska? Oh, it's getting crazy up here. I got uh, that girlfriend, she's got me running, you know. Yeah, now what's her name? Do we need to know her? Because uh... her, her name's Deborah, but she told me I got to call her the goddess. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Otis? Yeah. Now, is this getting serious, is it? The last time we talked, you just met in a coffee shop and. You whipped her up a latte, if I remember correctly, and yeah, she's pretty good. She's a keeper, you know. Yeah. So you yeah, like she's her. got a she's got a job in her teeth. So that up here, that's pretty good, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so you can't ask for much more than that. We thought we'd just give you a few holiday recipes. That... Mom's holiday fruit and cake recipe. And let me recipe. write these down. Okay. Do it, yeah, do it slowly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, one cup water. A cup of sugar, mm-hmm. four large eggs, mm-hmm. two cups of dried fruit, whatever you want, a teaspoon of baking soda, and a teaspoon of salt, mm-hmm. one cup brown sugar, some lemon juice, some nuts, your choice again, and a gallon of whiskey. Good. Isn't that a lot? First, you want to sample the whiskey to check for quality. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Okay, good Take egg. a large bowl and check the whiskey again just to be sure it's of the highest quality. Okay, okay good. Turn on the electric mixer and beat one cup butter in a large fluffy bowl (laughs) and add one teaspoon of sugar and beat it again. And then make sure the whiskey is still okay. Just try it again. And then you want to cry another cup. (laughs) And then just chuck in the cup of dried fruit. Mix on the turner. And if the fried root gets stuck in the beaterers, Pry it loose with a Drew Scriber. <laughs> what? Sample the whiskey to check for toncicity. Good. For what? Toncicity. <laughs> now sift the lemon juice and strain your nuts. <laughs> Add one table spoon of sugar, something, or whatever you can find. Throw the bowl out the window and go to bed, because who the hell likes fruitcake anyway? (laughs) You know, Pat, since Randy's been uh, filling in for Ronnie, everybody at the station is is practicing their Randy Hunley imitation. Here's the pitch to Tyler. There's a strike, and the count 0-2. Can I give you my impression? Go right ahead. Oh, that's exactly right, Pat. (laughs) (laughs) What do you think, Randy? Uh, Kiss my (laughs) hillbilly (laughs) face. All righty. Uh, hey, Pete. Hey, Spike. I'll give you another prize if you take that phone into your dryer and put it in the dryer. Okay, well, I'm right by the dryer. All right, now just put it in and give me about 20 seconds of tumbling. You got to leave it on. I will. All right, this is Pete's phone. <laughs> okay, we're going into the dryer now. All right, now don't you get in it. Just put the phone in there. I'm in here with it. Don't leave him alone. <laughs> get out of there. Do you want it on fluff or delicate? I want it on fluff. Okay, you got it, big right, boy. Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> here we go. <laughs> I 
Hello? Hey, Pete. Pete. Hello? Oh, Pete. Pete. <laughs> yeah. Pete, are you married? Yes, I am. Because somebody got to be there with some smarts to watch those kids. Pardon me? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Pete, that was... <laughs> WTF!